Thank you, Kevin. I hope you enjoyed those two wonderful talks. We have a lot more um, coming in the second half. We'll now have a 20 minute intermission and I wanna ask two favors. If you have any questions at all for our speakers that have spoken or for Andy Revkin who's coming up, please write them on the, the what did Richard say, the old school way on the cards um, and pass them into the volunteers who'll be circulating or tweet them to hashtag SSF and we'll be going through those in the, in the beginning of the intermission to select some questions to ask. And also the festival organizers would really like your feedback on this event. So either during the intermission or on your way out, there'll be feedback forms in the lobbies that they'd love you to take just a quick minute to fill out. So thank you very much. Um, first, I wanna introduce Andy Revkin. Andy has spent three decades covering uh, science and the environment, much of that for the New York Times. He's currently the writer of the popular Dot Earth blog and the author of three books, including The North Pole Was Here. He is one of the few reporters to have actually filed stories from the North Pole. He's also broken numerous stories about government interference into scientific work on climate change. Since 2010, he's also been a senior fellow for environmental understanding at New York's Pace University. His many awards for science writing include the prestigious 2011 National Academy of Sciences Communication Award. And I just wanna say personally, as a fellow journalist, I find Andy simply amazing. He operates on all channels, 24 hours a day, tweeting, emailing, blogging. Um, but unlike a lot of social media, which has just a high level of noise, um, Andy has this high baud rate, and he's creating this seamless, thoughtful dialogue about this really difficult issue of climate change. He's been described as a knowledge-based journalist that provides a cross-cutting discussion of science, policy, and politics that challenges assumptions among partisans on all sides and widens the menu of options available to policymakers rather than narrowing them to just a few. This is something all journalists should aspire to, but few do. And finally, if you're wondering, can he sing? The answer is yes. He's a talented performing musician. He's performed with Pete Seeger. He's currently recording an album. Please welcome Andy Revkin. Thank you. I actually got into a little bit of trouble today. I think I bought a guitar here in Seattle. I was not planning on <laughs> Emerald City, Emerald City guitars. They're beautiful. Uh, I am going to sell one to make up for that. So uh, my wife is okay with it. Anyway, so, so you've, got a, you've got a big dose of uh, physical science the last uh, session. Um, and I'm, I'm going to talk about a little bit more science, but it's what some people call soft science, which is unfortunate because there is empirical work done that, that gets at a different part of the climate challenge. And that's the part, you know, there's all this information, there's all this data, and then there's us, and there's the climate in here, um, which, is, which I've taken to calling our inconvenient mind. And... Uh, so after I, I, I wrote about this issue for decades, literally from 1985 onward, mainly as a biogeophysical thing. You know, greenhouse gases come up, they change the climate system, they're changing the chemistry of the ocean. What does that do? And then what can you do about it? It's mostly technical, old fashioned science. And then it was around 2005, 2006, I started uh, talking about this stuff and I realized I don't have my clicker, so I should get that. Um, <laughs> the climate in our heads is an interesting place. And uh, there's amazing work that illustrates that. And it's not touchy-feely, it's empirical. And uh, it basically, the reality is that we all have a different way of, thank you, approaching information. And when I started digging in on this, it really was, you know, I, I've stood on the sea ice at the North Pole 10 years ago with scientists from the University of Washington, hooray, Jamie Morrison and others, and the ice is, sea ice is cracking under your feet and shifting and making weird noises, and it's moving a couple miles a day. That's why the book was The North Pole was here, because we were there momentarily, and then we were kind of like not there. Um, and so he, feeling the sea ice cracking under your feet while you're standing on a 14,000 foot deep ocean is unnerving, okay? Um, I was in the Amazon in the late 1980s as the forest was being burned by cattle ranchers. And so I've been you know, in unnerving situations, but this was the unnerving stuff. So here, this is a little test case of why things are hard and why you haven't seen more science create more action. These guys have one thing in common. They're all, they all won Nobel Prizes in physics. So that means they're pretty smart. Um, Steve Chu was the energy secretary until a few weeks ago. Very smart guy, has a very conventional concern about global warming. 
and what to do about it. He was, he was a supporter of a climate cap and trade policy under the Obama administration. The guy right above him, Ivar Gaever, Nobel Prize in Physics, 1977, he thinks it's religion. That, that global warming war concern is a religious thing. Uh, the American Physical Society a few years ago came out with a, uh, a, a statement on global warming that had the words incontrovertible, and that made his head explode. He says, that's religion. Science is not about incontrovertible things. Uh, uh, Laughlin, Robert Laughlin here is kind of in the middle, and Burton Richter is a Nobel Prize winning physicist who is deeply concerned about climate change, and his, for him, uh, Nuclear energy is the thing forward, not a cap and trade bill and that kind of thing. So, so here, so, th so this basically says, if you go into a bar and you want, if you want to have a debate about global warming, you can kind of go in and have one of these guys standing at your side, like Woody Allen in that movie where he has uh, Marshall McLuhan comes into the line to argue his case for, for something. You, you could basically pick a Nobel Prize winner to suit your predisposition, and that's what a guy at uh, Yale named Dan Kahane, K-A-H-A-N. He runs this website called Cultural Cognition, and, and that's basically his term for the reality that most of us absorb information through filters and that are premised, uh, predisposed to either reject or accept information based on, on something else, our, our libertarian or our liberal, our communitarian individualist tendencies. And that's why you end up with this kind of, uh, this is you know super wicked situation for many reasons, and this is one of them. So this, so you've heard these wonderful presentations on science. Here's another, there was another wonderful presentation on science and global warming. It was in the Supreme Court in 2006. And I'm just gonna quickly go through this. It'd take a minute. You have to help out though. So James Milkey was representing the state of Massachusetts. The state and others were trying to uh, say the EPA must regulate carbon dioxide as a pollutant under the Clean Air Act. And in the middle of this, uh, Justice Scalia said something that kind of confused the science and um, James Milkey respectfully corrects him. Uh, respectfully, Your Honor, it's not the stratosphere, it's the troposphere. Uh, Justice Scalia says, troposphere, whatever. I've met him, he's kind of like that. Uh, I told you before that I'm not a scientist. Laughter. <laughs> that's, that's actually in the transcript. That's, that's why I don't want to have to deal with global warming to tell you the truth. Now, 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 and it's very easy if, you know, depending on your predispositions to react to this, as saying, oh, that conservative Luddite justice, you know. Or you could say, you know, there's a little bit of that feeling in me. We all don't want to have to deal with this to some extent. And I think there's, that's an important truth that, that, you know, I flew here on a plane, uh, burned a couple tons worth of CO2, emitted a couple tons of CO2 to get here. And, and uh, you know, we're all living mobile, mobilized electro, uh, electric lives and climate controlled rooms. And, and, you know, we don't want to have to deal with that reality of decarbonizing. Um, given how it's, you know, we're so comfortable, literally, with fossil fuels. And, uh, you know, these issues, another issue is the science is built. There's been four iterations of the IPCC reports. There's another one coming this fall. Don't count on a magical IPCC 5 or 6 or another story by me suddenly, gra you know, galvanizing the change uh, that will be needed. And by the way, I'm leading in, this, this is the down part, but there is an upside here you'll see in a minute. Believe it, it's true. So here's, um, you know, everyone latches onto the polls. Whether you're a skeptic or a believer, you kind of watch the polls. What are people thinking about climate change now? And here's, uh, you know, 1989 onward. So basically my entire career's worth of writing hundreds of articles in a documentary, and a book, two, two books about climate change. And, and basically the public's meh. Well, you know that word that all of our sons and daughters, <laughs> meh? Where, where did that come from? Anyway, we're kind of meh on global warming. And we've been kind of meh, up and down, little variability. You know, do you see a trend there? Like you looked at the temperature trends, do you see? The trend is like that, okay? And uh, it's what I, and the reason I have these flasks here is the, the, the metaphor for me is uh, it's basically water sloshing in a shallow pan. You know, when you're carrying something to the kitchen table, it, it, there's a lot of movement. The water's sloshing around. Our feelings about global warming uh, one day or the next day are moving around, but there's not a lot of depth. And when the, the key issue to track for public concern about an issue is what's called salience. Um, and this has no salience. It's basically stickiness. Uh, one of the other realities in the social sciences is this finite, this concept of a finite basket of worries. You know, we all carry around this basket every day of stuff, you know, my, what's my son gonna do this summer on his, you know, 15 year old hanging around the house all day, uh, or that's, that's my issue going home. Uh, or, or, you know, how you pay the bills or, stay employed or uh, pay, you know, make sure you have health care. 
And, and, and these issues um, don't get in that basket very often. And, and there's, a, there's kind of, you know, we've heard, we've heard this term climate, climate denier. There's a lot of denial, and, and there are actual professional deniers whose job is to cast doubt about global warming, no question about it. But I was in denial on climate for, for, for decades. I expected more information would change the world, just as many scientists do. And I've learned, as you heard a minute ago, that's actually not that simple. And then there's this idea out there that, well, if you just clear away the disinformation, we'll all magically decarbonize. And to me, this cartoon grew out of a, I gave a talk in New York City a year or two ago, and a young um, woman in the audience, Kathy Zhang, a student, uh, uh, she illustrated this concept, which is that uh, essentially it's like the, it's another hidden law of physics. Uh, an object that, you know, at rest stays at rest. Well, society on fossil fuels is an object at rest. And, and if you're in the uh, camp that wants to keep things the way they are, you could be standing there. I want this cartoon to be redone with that person with a feather duster going like this. This is so easy. You know, I'm trying to keep this boulder in place. And this is uh, you know, people who are concerned about moving the bar. And, and it's like moving a big immovable object. And in fact, if you misstep, it's like trying to move it up a hill. It'll come back and, and hurt you. So it's, it's not like clear away the disinformation and we'll magically move forward. There are bigger issues here. So that's kind of the downside. And that's why I took this picture at the, on the last day of the climate negotiations in Copenhagen, 2009. It was actually my last day as a staff writer at the New York Times also, because I took a buyout because newspapers are kind of shrinking. But I still write every day um, as a freelancer. So, and, and uh, there was this, uh, a, a reader at Dot Earth wrote this. Are, are we stuck with blah, 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 bang? And we're not. We are not. Um, the same social science that shows you all this kind of inertia on fossil fuels uh, or on global warming shows you some, some really interesting things. And these are the only wonky slides I'll show you. We're almost done. So 2009, other researchers at Yale uh, who have been studying human attitudes about glo global warming, American attitudes, they put us in little bubbles. There's the alarmed, the uh, concerned, cautious, disengaged, doubtful, and dismissive. And, and those bubbles have changed size a little bit over time. This was 2009 in the run-up to the climate bill. So the question here is support for cap-and-trade policy. Even the alarmed were, were meh. So if even the alarmed are maybe, you know, this is a yes, no, that tells me that bill was never going anywhere. So anyone who thought that that was kind of a realistic uh, alternative was, was dreaming. But here's the good news. Support for providing rebates for purchases of solar panels and fuel efficient vehicles. Everybody, even the, look at the dismissives are meh, which is a pretty rare thing. <laughs> I'm sure you know some. And everyone else is like, yeah, that's a pretty cool thing. You know, and, but when I show this to economists, I know there's at least one in the audience, the comic economist. Um, they say, well, that's just because you're giving away something. And I said, yeah, that's true, you know, that's right. But then this question, support for requiring, mandate, requiring 45 mile per gallon uh, fuel efficiency across vehicle fleets, even if it costs more, $1,000 more, would you support that? And look at that. Almost everybody is still kind of, yeah, these guys are a little bit closer to meh. And, and they're like, well, you know, no. But that says to me something really important. If you change the conversation to things that we all care about, efficiency, you know, not being wasteful, um, innovation, moving things forward, uh, you can actually create consensus where there seems to be only polarization. And I think that's a really important message. So if I had to have a bumper sticker on my Prius about this stuff, and they're both wonky, okay? I would choose join the energy quest over fight the climate crisis. It's just my choice. We're, we're a variegated lot. There'll be other people. Bill McKibben would not choose the same bumper sticker, and that's fine. We're friends. And we have to figure out that, uh, I think we have to come to grips with the reality that moving forward will involve a diverse range of views on the best course. But as long as everybody's tending in a certain direction, you can have progress. And the same goes for scientists. You know, Jim Hansen, who I've been writing about since the 1980s, he has chosen a certain course. He has attitudes about Keystone and, and nuclear power. He's for nuclear power. And, and he, he's gotten himself arrested. He left NASA so he could do that more. <laughs> An interesting idea. And, uh, Susan Solomon, who led the 2007 IPCC report, she literally, at the, at the rollout of that report in Paris in 2007, she was like, don't, don't ask me what to think, what I think or feel about this problem. Here's the science, you guys go forward. And then students, there's, there was a kid I wrote about at, a, at MIT, 18-year-old, 
who's inventing an electric motorcycle, that's a prototype he built, as his solution. And you know, we're not going to save the world with 9 billion people riding around on electric motorcycles, especially if it's coal-powered electricity. And then there are kids in the hallways at the climate talks protesting. And, and, you know, and uh, neither one is wrong or right. They're just different. And they, but they're engaged, and they have a, a sense of, of urgency, but also hopefully some patience. Because the other reality about this, about this problem is it's not going to be, this is not a one piece of legislation, a one treaty problem. It's about a new relationship with energy and the atmosphere. And we have to have a little patience, even as we retain that commitment to moving forward. So thank you very much. And now we're going to enter into a conversation with the, my partners here.